two more sort of bull cycles, it would be reasonable that the top would be somewhere between one and 10 million per Bitcoin in today's dollars. The main thing that it does is fix all the incentives that surround everything. And just about anything that sucks in the world right now is a product of misaligned incentives. The Bitcoin price that you might be able to guess could happen with a Kamala Harris regime doesn't really have a top because she might end the United States within her first four year term. If she gets in, I think all bets are off on the price of Bitcoin. It removes the ability of the state to tax us through our savings. But it's also protecting us from a different kind of violence from the state, which is the, the sort of 6102 effect. The man with the gun has to look you in the eyes now because Bitcoin exists. We're kind of in an interesting spot as Canadians because we have maybe the most incompetent government in the world. I've definitely seen a bunch of them have left. We have fewer really good quality Canadian Bitcoiners than we did four years ago. If Trump is elected. Our Bitcoin price will be somewhere between 20,000 and 300,000 US within his term. So we'll probably be in a scenario where there are are six or seven currencies in the world five years from now. And at some point, all of them will enter that death spiral. The United States dollar should probably end up being the last to die, given its reserve status. And all the ETFs, BlackRock, etc., all of MicroStrategy's coins are all sitting in Coinbase. The chances that the Coinbase will hand those coins over to the United States government in their entirety are 100%. It's just a matter of time. Why does Bitcoin fix everything? Yeah. Um, broadly, it comes down to incentives. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of ways that Bitcoin is a useful tool. It helps with the energy industry. It helps with the payments industry. It can it can be useful in those ways. But at the core, the main thing that it does is fix all the incentives that surround everything. And when you drill down to it, you can pick a problem in the world, and just about anything that sucks in the world right now is a product of misaligned incentives. And so. In most cases, what's going on is not just the problem of the debasement of the currency. You know, the government is printing the money to spend the money. The problem is that they're actually spending it in ways that make our lives worse. They're creating all of these perverse incentives around literally every area of society, which is pretty much where they have their fingers into at this point is everything. And when they spend money, they tend to make things worse rather than better in almost every single aspect of of our lives super interesting yeah because when when you really come down to it, it's like uh, when you think about a problem that you want to solve i don't know like a big one like uh, i don't know murdering or, or something like that you in the first of all yeah bitcoin cannot solve that but if you really align the incentives and every human has the incentive to work with each other and if i work for something nice in the bitcoin community and i save everything in bitcoin that benefits you because i save it in bitcoin that's an that's an amazing mind shift uh, uh, to make, but that's probably only true once we reach like hyper Bitcoinized world. Like that, that's only when we actually are in in a Bitcoin world already. Or is is Bitcoin fixing things b before that already? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is already fixing a lot of things, but it's mostly fixing things for individuals right now. It's not really fixing the systemic stuff. So when <clears throat> When you talk about the example of murder um, or like violent crime more broadly, there is supposed to be a disincentive provided by the state to those kind of behaviors, right? And that's kind of the core of what the state is supposed to be is this mechanism that we've, we've, we've hired a service provider to protect us. We've hired them to provide the protection of physical safety and property rights. And a big part of the reason that the, the violent crime epidemic has been sweeping you know, major cities all around the world is because they're no longer providing that incentive that is really supposed to be the core of what the state provides. And so right out front, we're missing what should be a key incentive because the money that is supposed to be being spent on crime is being spent on painted sidewalks and whatever else the, the state decides we need more than safe cities. And on the flip side, which I think goes to your, your bigger question, um, it, you know, Part of the reason that people resort to crime in general, and especially violent crime, is because the world is not working out for them, right? And so when people are finding a hard time making ends meet, when they can't, they can't feed their family because their income is being inflated away and the cost of food and shelter is going through the roof, the incentives for violence go up. And so in the long term, that's how Bitcoin fixes violent crime is by removing the incentives for violent crime and returning us to a position where we have the, the, the proper incentive, proper disincentives to violent crime. And 
that big picture, I think, only happens when we get to that hyper Bitcoinization level. But at the individual level, it's already doing that. And all of us Bitcoiners are examples of that where, you know, we've been in a large part sheltered from the shitstorm of inflation that has hit most of the Western world because we've got Bitcoin. And so our incentives to violence are not going up the same way that other people's incentives are. Interesting. So that's really interesting when, when, when you think about that. But let's come to right now, like let's come to what, what an individual has that is adopting Bitcoin right now. What is Bitcoin protecting us against on an individual level who is adopting Bitcoin right now? Yeah, I mean, immediately it's protecting us against the debasement of our spending power. So it, it removes the ability of the state to tax us through our savings. And that, I think, is the, the single biggest thing. But it's also protecting us from a different kind of violence from the state, which is the, the, the sort of 6102 effect. The idea that the state might take our money at some point, at gunpoint. And so in the long term, Bitcoin will make it a lot harder for them to do that. And if, if they are going to 6102, the general population to decide that they want to seize everyone's Bitcoin, it's, it's a very direct seizure of wealth, right? They have to come to your door, kick in the door, <clears throat> find your seed words, et cetera. And that is something that I think is a lot less palatable to the population in general than the way that they're taking that value right now, which is just by printing more money to spend. And so the way that I put it is the man with the gun has to look you in the eyes now because Bitcoin exists. And so those two things, I think, are, are, are big ways that Bitcoiners are being protected. The, the next one that, that can't be overstated, and we've had personal experience with that in Canada, is the censorship resistance. Right. We're, we're moving into an area with this rise of CDBCs and, uh, and different kinds of digital currencies that um, I think most people can see where, will inevitably lead to an extra layer of both censorship and surveillance. And Bitcoin is a way to opt out of both of those problems as well. I think it's a, CBDC is a real big danger, I feel like, uh, for humanity and people that living in a jurisdiction that are rolling out those digital currencies. Now it goes like, uh, it, it seems to be like a new trend that they actually call themselves just like digital euro, uh, because that's probably how they, how they will sell it uh, in a better way. Is it also, could it also be at that point a, a risk for Bitcoin or is that point already reached that we, we don't have that risk from CBDCs anymore? No, I don't think it's a risk. I think it actually in the short term, um, essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about these currencies is just improving the fiat payment rails. And at least in Canada and the US where I have more experience, the fiat payment rails are actually a major impediment to Bitcoin businesses. And so when we take payment for Bitcoin, when we take fiat, we engage in a whole bunch of risks because of the fact that those payments are ultimately reversible, they're very prone to fraud, and they're very slow. And so a, a central bank digital currency would actually be really useful for Bitcoin exchanges, but not really for anyone else. And I think, I think we've seen enough backlash against the acronym, the central bank digital currencies, that we're going to see most of the governments of the world drop in the idea, at least in so many words. Um, we've seen that from the Bank of Canada recently. They've said that they're they're no longer pursuing a central bank digital currency and instead will be focusing on improving our settlement rails. And really, like, there's not much of a difference there because all of our currency is already digital, right? Like your, your dollars or your, your euros, they sit in a, in a database in a bank. And all that we're talking about is moving that database to the central bank, which in theory gets them a little bit closer to that transaction volume and allows them more power over censorship and, and, uh, and surveillance. But in reality, it's not really changing anything, right? It's still all digital. And so I think what we're going to see now is them abandoning the acronym. And they're going to do and try and do the same thing just by um, positioning it as a payments improvement, which, you know, we don't need the central banks to do that. If you think about the way that banks all over the world do these like T plus two settlements, it takes two days to clear something. Like there's not a single other area of the world that takes two days to clear a piece of digital information. Right? Like the banks could have been doing this with, with existing technology, without any blockchains, without any extra mess. They could have been doing this in the 90s. They could have been doing instant settlement. And the, the technology is, is certainly there, right? You wouldn't 
you wouldn't find it acceptable that you go to watch a movie on Netflix and it's like, okay, you can watch this in two days once it gets there, right? Like, and if a movie can get there immediately, then certainly a digital entry in a database can get there immediately. And so really, I think what they're going to be trying to do is provide us as consumers with a bribe and say, we're going to take the system that, that deliberately sucks. And it sucks because the, the banks, the banks keep it that way because they want to keep the money for the extra two days. Right. And so that will be the bribe is that we can do this safer, faster digital payment settlement system. But the, 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 the downside to that bribe will be that the government gets all that information and can much more directly freeze accounts using, you know, whatever emergency powers they give themselves at the time. I feel like it's, uh, that, that whole digital currency thing is, is just a way to extend the life of, of the fiat, fiat, fiat world. It's like giving them another, another breath before the eventual collapse. Yeah. And I, I feel like there, there might be an angle there as well where, You know, the way that the way that central banks create money is this like fairly messy, multi-layered machine that kind of obfuscates the fact that they are, in fact, creating money. And that's not something that most people see when they see, you know, government bonds being issued. They don't think about that as the creation of money, but it is. And I think a central bank digital currency or essentially moving that database to the government's servers might give them a much more direct way to print money. In the sense, and especially if you tie that to something like a UBI payment, right, where they might say, we're going to just we're going to create these new digital dollars out of nowhere and give them out just like straight, straight helicopter money. Um, you know, I think it's very likely that whatever the system they end up moving to. Uh, is going to come with a carrot more so than a stick. Yeah, probably carrots work better. And it is it is really interesting because uh, I mean we kind of saw that with that whole how was it called world coin thing. And I saw it. I was back then in Munich when where, where I lived back then when this thing was a uh, popular. People really lined up to scan the iris to get some shit coin. And I'm like. Why are you doing that? Because there was a small incentive there. And how big will be the incentive when, when like governments come into the game and, and give a digital currency when it's not just like a small startup that wants to try that out and, and scans your ears, but what if like the government that most people still trust actually does that? And I mean, in, in Austria, it's like that. Maybe in Canada already is reversing where people don't trust the, the government. I don't know how the current state is, but that's, that's, that's really interesting for me how this, uh, this will all shake out in the end when, when governments come in and countries come in like, hey, we have that digital currency. You use it because we have that carrot that like, I don't know, a hundred bucks or something like that when you sign up the first account or something like that. I mean, El Salvador did the same thing with Bitcoin. I did had a sign up bonus also there, but uh, it's not comparable. Uh, really, really cool. Um, by, way, by the way, on the topic of Canada, uh, I mentioned it before uh, we were recording. Most Canadian Bitcoiners I speak to on the podcasts are no longer in, in Canada. You, you said like you're in, in Canada, but not you're in Albuquerque, you're not really in Canada. Um, do you see a future for, for Bitcoiners in, in Canada, in Albuquerque? I guess so, but uh, in Canada also. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Yes and no. Um, a book that I, I, I hope you've read that I, I think I recommend all Bitcoiners read is The Sovereign Individual. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually rereading this right now. And one of the interesting things that it points out, you know, it's, its general thesis is that the day of the large scale nation state is over. And it actually predicts that Canada will be one of the first to fall. And the reason for that is because we're so large. You know, we have such a small population in such a large space. And like to compare to like the European example, um, the distance between Calgary and Quebec, um, you know, it'd, it'd be like comparing Austria to like Azerbaijan or somewhere like that. You know, like it's a it's a vast difference in, in space and the cultural differences over that area are quite significant as well. And we do have some Canadian cultural influences that uh, that keep us together. You know, when I talk about the potential breakup of Canada. Um, one thing that everybody brings up is what about the hockey team? Um, you know, we're, 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 we're very patriotic about being the best country in the world for hockey. But other than that, like there's not a whole bunch of stuff that holds us together as a nation. And so 
I think as the economic incentives get worse and worse, um, the, the, the likelihood that Canada stays together gets, gets less and less likely. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm in, I'm in Alberta. And Alberta is in Western Canada, where the we're sort of like the the Texas of of Canada, we're often called, and we're sort of like more freedom minded. You know, we have the oil and gas industry here. Um, we have a lot more individualistic population, but and as a result of of our oil and gas riches, we we pretty much pay for the whole country to subsist, and we don't get nearly enough back from the country as compared to what we put in, and that's. Um, very obvious in a bunch of areas, and so the incentives are not there for Alberta to continue from an economic perspective to be a part of Canada. And really, what's holding Canada together now is is not rational self interest on the part of the provinces or the people in the provinces. It's just this kind of like archaic nationalism mixed with sort of slow moving political machines that would take a long time. Um, but I think if you had a if you had a well-informed population looking at the incentives, we would leave right now because we're we're getting looted. We we put in way more money than we get back out, and the long-term outcome is that the the government of Canada is not going to be able to continue to pay its exorbitant spending. And I think we're we're kind of in an interesting spot as Canadians because we have the unique. It, it, it can be a it can be a benefit and it can be a downside that we have maybe the most incompetent government in the world. You know, they're they're a bunch of bumbling buffoons, and at this point, they can't really do much of anything right at all. And in some ways, that's a benefit because, as I mentioned earlier, when they print money to spend money, part of what they want to spend that money on is stepping on our necks, right? They want to keep us down. They want to stifle our speech. They want to they want to keep us from seeing the truth of what they're doing to our country. And they're just not really good at that or anything else. And so the downside to that is that, you know, a lot of their, their short term and more recent policies have been just catastrophically bad. And that's led to Bitcoiners who have the means to leave, to leave in large numbers. And, you know, we've seen people moving all over South and Central America. Um, people who can work from anywhere are not incentivized to stay in a jurisdiction that takes advantage of them. It's as plain and simple as that. And my hope is that Alberta, um, either as a separate entity at some point or even within Canada, can can draw a lot of those people in because we are more of a freedom-focused jurisdiction and we don't have, um, at least at the provincial level, we don't have a government that's looking to subjugate us and put us down at every every step, I think. And so I'm not like I'm not going anywhere. If I leave, I'm taking the province with me, but uh, I've definitely seen a bunch of them have left. A bunch of Canadian, we, we, we have fewer really good quality Canadian Bitcoiners than we did four years ago. So, Absolutely. But it's still within Canada and has the same tax system, or is it already kind of separate? Uh, um, uh, is it comparable with the United States, or is it like really like one thing like Austria? Yeah, it's um, it, it's a, it's a mix. We have federal taxes and we have provincial taxes. Uh, our provincial taxes are the lowest anywhere in Canada. They're they're incredibly low. And if you if you measure the all in corporate tax rate, we're actually lower here than anywhere in the United States. So our, our taxes are quite favorable here. Um, but they're you know the big tax that you can't really measure is the money printing. And when they print money, we in Alberta as a province we don't get to print money. The federal government gets to print money. And we don't get to decide where that money is spent. And so disproportionately, the money that they they print is spent elsewhere in the country. And when they do spend it here, it's usually to to harm us. That's the funny thing with, with Bitcoin. It's like if once you adopt the Bitcoin standard, you're kind of even in, in favor of inflation because this this will just drive Bitcoin adoption. Long. Like that, that's probably the the quickest way we get to Bitcoin adoption, if all governments start the real hard printer tomorrow and we like have hyperinflation like in, in one year or two years, I guess that's yeah. the fastest way to have a Bitcoinization. Yeah, there's, there's a whole group of Canadian Bitcoiners that count themselves as accelerationists. And so their idea is like, we should be voting for Justin Trudeau, who is our, our megalomaniac moron leader. 
because the the more of his leadership this country has, the faster it will melt down and the sooner that we can get out from under the boot of this centralized dictatorship. I, as I heard the same argument for Kamala Harris. <laughs> yeah. I hear, I hear the same one for, for, for yeah. the States also. Yeah. And it, it's funny because I was... Um, I was looking at some of your old shows and I see you have a lot of price predictions on there. And I was like, I don't even know how to make a price prediction, but I think that any, any price prediction has to come with um, a prediction for Kamala and a prediction for Trump, because I think it meaningfully impacts the difference. And a, a, a Trump presidency, I think is better for the price of Bitcoin in the short term. You know, we would probably see some, we'll probably get Ross Albrecht out and get a bunch of buzz and, the likelihood of another 3x or so bull run happening and we get 150 grand or um you know anywhere between like my 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 like finger in the air which is almost never wrong um is that if if trump is elected our bitcoin price will be somewhere between 20,000 and 300,000 us within his term but the the bitcoin price that you might be able to guess could happen with a Kamala Harris uh, regime doesn't really have uh, doesn't really have a top because she might end the United States within her first four year term like that. That is entirely possible. And in a scenario like that, the price of Bitcoin goes to, you know, it, it, measured in today's dollars, it goes to a trillion or, or something to that effect. I don't I don't know what the math is, but. Taking out the world's U.S dollar, the world's reserve currency, um, is something that might happen under, you know, the seemingly insane leadership that uh, she's trying to bring to the table. And I think if, like, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem realistic to me that the uh, Democrats could win without really severe cheating. And I think that's something that, um, you know, most people who are watching the situation with a, a clear eye would probably acknowledge is that there, you know, there's going to be cheating on both sides, I think, but the Democrats seem to be a lot better at it. And if she gets in, um, I think all bets are off on the price of Bitcoin. You know, we, we may, we may move from where Bitcoin is now, which is kind of like a risk on price, you know, people are gambling on it. And so when, <clears throat> when markets go down, Bitcoin goes down, um, which is not what we should expect those of us who know what Bitcoin is really, right? We should expect it to be a safe haven asset for uh, times of financial trouble. And ultimately, I think it will be that out of necessity, right? A, a Kamala Harris presidency could switch that logic and get us to a point where people are actually getting into Bitcoin in the United States specifically to avoid starving to death, which I think will be a major incentive uh, in the in the future, at some point, when, before we get to hyper Bitcoinization, you know the saying is always, everyone gets into Bitcoin when they deserve, and in a lot of cases, that's what it's frankly going to be. It's just the only way to to keep your family safe and to to be able to survive another day is to be able to have a way to save the value that you create with your time. And a completely insane United States that is printing an unlimited amount of money, you know, that I think gets us closer to that that logic switch. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that's what also a lot of people uh, point out with Kamala Harris uh, uh, thing. It's also interesting. Uh, it's, it's, I had the discussion last time, I think with the guest that was actually released yesterday about Bitcoin price prediction. He's like, yeah, all Bitcoin price predictions are true. Just like the, 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 uh, the, the question is just like when, Yeah. eventually they, they, they will go to zero. So like, if you call like, yeah, like Bitcoin will be two quadrillion dollars. Yeah. You, at some point you will have, uh, you, you were right. Uh, and that's, that, that's the interesting thing about price prediction, but I guess it's, it's interesting to, uh, think about what the price in Bitcoin could be in today's tallest terms. So like in, in, without no inflation, if like assume that for moving on, uh, what, what could. I mean, the better question then probably is like, what can Bitcoin buy you in, in like uh, 10, 50 years? Like what will be the, the meaning of like one Bitcoin or 0.1 Bitcoin or like all those, those specific numbers? I think that's a, I think that's a bigger question to ask of like, okay, how much of the total net assets will Bitcoin consume and, and all those, those things? What do you see as like the, 
most bullish end case, if there's an end case <laughs> for Bitcoin, it's another question, but it's the most bullish outlook for, for Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, you can't really separate the two things. You can't separate the debasement of the dollar from the increase in price in Bitcoin because they, they will always be happening at once. Um, I think those kind of, you know, going to trillions or quadrillions of dollars, those assume that the dollar has entered a death spiral of hyperinflation, which leads to hyper-Bitcoinization. Um, I think in the absence of a dollar death spiral, we're looking at still a scenario where that debasement can can drive the price of Bitcoin very significantly. And then the question is, like, there, there's a scenario in the world where Kamala Harris gets elected and runs a, a catastrophically bad administration, very much like the current one who is sending mass amounts of money overseas and funding war after war and pork barrel spending every which direction and allowing the border to remain open and all these things that we, we see that are, are causing, I would call a rapid degenerate degeneration of society in the United States. Um, so it is possible that she does all those things without going completely off the cliff. And in a scenario like that, we can probably see, you know, it, it, it's going to be worse than it has been the last four years. And so the question becomes, does that shift of logic happen from Bitcoin being a, a speculative risk on asset that people are, are gambling in, in the markets in order to to sell for more dollars later, which is basically what it is now, or does it make that shift to more more towards what we expect gold to be, which is this this hedge to all of those things, the hedge to the money printing, which logically it is, but that's just not how the the markets are treating it right now. And so I think that will really determine very significantly where the price goes. Um, but my my finger in the air for a Kamala Harris four year term. Um, Without, like, if we if we remove the hyper Bitcoinization scenario, um, is is probably probably a, a wider range, and so the the bottom end might be lower. It might be ten or fifteen thousand dollars, and then the up, upper end would be much higher. So, um, I would say over the next four years, you know, if we're looking at uh, maybe two more sort of bull cycles, um, it would be it would be reasonable that the top would be somewhere between one and ten million per Bitcoin in today's dollars. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Out. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first 
never mind Bitcoin block in there. And of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. That, that seems at first aggressive, but I think if you really think about it, that that's really doable in, in, the, in the upper end of it. By the way, you mentioned that death, the dollar death spiral. Is that in the long run even avoidable? Is it just a matter of time till this spiral begins? It, yeah, it is just a matter of time. Um, there, there, there are some ways that current company or sorry, uh, countries can combat this death spiral. I think right now they're all kind of racing away from it. And we've seen a lot of countries sort of start into that spiral. And some, you know, Venezuela, Zimbabwe are already gone. Um, but we've got all these countries like Lebanon and Argentina that are right on the edge. And I would expect that a lot more of the world's small currencies are going to be hitting that death spiral in the near future. And at that point, then we get into a competitive scenario about what kind of money that country is going to be using, right? And in some cases, that will be very quickly delegated by a central government. And in most of those cases, the central government will pick um, a regionally or politically expedient uh, major currency. So we may see more joining the euro. We may see a bunch of African countries moving to the yuan, um, Asian countries moving to the yuan. And we'll probably be in a scenario where there are six or seven currencies in the world uh, five years from now. And at some point, all of them will enter that death spiral. And so the prevailing logic would be, I think, that the United States dollar should probably end up being the last to die, given its reserve status and its the, the sort of unique ability that the United States has to, to export their debt to other countries by having other countries adopt their currency and then printing more of them. Um, I think the dollar will probably be the last one, but it is pretty much inevitable that they get there eventually. And the only thing that they can do to slow it down is very unlikely because it really involves stopping the incredible rate of spending. And in, in countries like the US, where the debt is so large that the payments to cover the debt are, in fact, so large, even just you know, drastically reducing government spending isn't going to be enough to stop that death spiral because you still have to pay for the money that you've already printed. And so I think it's very unlikely, but if a country went back to a gold standard, that would it would remove their ability to continue the fiscal excess that they've been engaging in, but it would make it much more likely that their currency survives in the long term. It's interesting, yeah. I, I, love, uh, I love that. Uh, it's interesting how when you adopt bitcoin and you understand all of the sudden this is a financial system then you are all of the sudden really relaxed because you know where it ends but at the same time it's quite frightening <laughs> like oh yeah like when when my i don't know sister is now holding 100 percent of of her money in euros because she's in austria and she trusts that she has to adopt the bitcoin standard right now otherwise maybe her whole net worth is, is gone and then you are, as the single bitcoin in the family you're like oh shit i have to stack for all those people because at some point they, they will uh, uh bang on my door and like hey robin you, you're a bitcoiner right <laughs> yeah so it's an interesting scenario with, with bitcoin as I yeah and i i think um that's where the sort of like get off zero campaign gets to be so important and you know getting your sister to put ten dollars a week into bitcoin is not going to matter at all to her. But if the scenario that we're talking about, if the, the, the euro collapses and you guys are left with no functional currency in your, in your region, then the people holding Bitcoin are going to be in a drastically better position than those who had all their assets in dollar or in euros, honestly. And I think we're kind of starting to see that idea creep into the sort of popular lexicon around the world. We've got a We've got a credit union, like a small bank here in Alberta, that um, is trying to do this. They want to be holding, <clears throat> they want to be holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet of the bank. The regulators are not letting them do that yet. They're still trying to figure out how to do that. But in the meantime, they're holding gold on the balance sheet of the bank with the idea that, you know, it's not a lot of gold. It's a it's a small percentage of the of their capital requirements and reserves. But the idea is that if the the entire financial system collapses these depositors will get more than zero. And that more than zero in a scenario like that will actually end up being quite a bit of 
spending power in all likelihood. And so that's kind of the way that I would, I would, I would pitch it to the, the friends and family that you realize you might need to pay for someday is that like, you know, it's, it's a hedge and it's, it's a hedge to everything that's going wrong in the world. And I think we're in a scenario now where just about everyone can see that there is something going majorly wrong in the world, right? They don't necessarily know that all of the ills of society are pretty much caused by this debasement of currency and this money printing, but they can at least feel the fact that state costs triple what it did two years ago. It's interesting when, when we talk about, because there was an election right now in, in Austria and uh, it, it feels like there's those, all those different political forces and they all blame it on someone else. Like there's a socialist like, oh, we have to tax the super rich. And then the right wing say like, oh, it's about immigrants. Uh, and then there's like, there's all those different political groups and they all point to other people, but they never point to the real reason why we have inflation and why those things are actually gone wrong. And they are just like serving their own uh, target groups, I guess. And it's, it's really interesting to see them like, oh yeah, he's talking shit, but he's talking a different shit, but <laughs> it's kind of the same shit. That they're talking uh, it's it's uh it's a nice and it's a, it's a nice thing when you're bitcoin and you're relaxed about it but it's it's kind of saddening also at the, at the same time let's come to a little bit uh, of a positive thing to talk about once we have this hyper bitcoinization what do you think is the most impactful thing that bitcoin changes in society that will lead to a, a better world or like a, a different world well it it, it, it'll realign all the incentives, essentially. And that's when we were talking about the Bitcoin fixes everything idea. That's kind of what it comes down to. And you can take just about anything. I was I was ranting about dishwashers earlier today in the same idea where, you know, a dishwasher is something that very clearly you want it to wash dishes. Right. And that's that's your incentive. That's my incentive to owning a dishwasher is to get my dishes washed. And at the same time, the government has different incentives about dishwashers. They, because of this massive machine around the climate change environmentalist movement, the government's incentive is that my dishwasher uses less power and less water. And those things are actually counter to my incentives about getting my dishes cleaned. And so when the government is essentially taking some of the money that I earn with my time, the value that I earn with my time, and stealing that from me by printing money, the end result is that they get to spend it on things that are not in my best interests. And dishwasher uh, efficiency campaigns are one of those things that actually have nothing to do with me. And so removing the ability of the government to prop up their own incentives realigns all of the incentives. And I think we'll get back to an economy that's much more driven on sort of a selfish rationalism wherein you can expect the people that you're dealing with to act in their own best interests, and they can expect that from, from you as well. And that, in turn, will lead to a much more streamlined and efficient version of the world economy, because so much of the value that's created in the economy won't be getting spent on things that actually have nothing to do with, that are not useful to really anyone, right? A huge percentage of government spending in the, in the entire world, really, is going to corruption. It's going to pay for the interests of the people who decide what the money gets spent on. And that's kind of an unavoidable element of government is if you give people the ability to print money and spend it, they will inevitably print it and they will inevitably spend it in their own best interests rather than the interests of the people that they, they claim and purport to, uh, to represent. It's interesting. Do you think that when we come to Bitcoin standard and we have that world where governments are more service-based, uh, like you pay government service because you actually drive on that road and it makes sense to to pay some central authority or some central like maybe everything gets privatized but that's a different discussion but if there's a government in the region and they own the streets you pay them for the streets in that scenario is there um, a need for social safety nets of some sort do, do you think there's there's some sort of thing where we we need to i don't know care for for those who maybe come to 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 the world with with uh, disabilities or something like that i mean that's a very small group but it's still like maybe interesting to know how this will work on a on a bitcoin world 
Yeah, I mean, there there are obviously needs, and when you say needs, these are these are things that I believe the world would be better with are are things like a social safety net, things like funding to take care of the disabled, funding to help with drug addiction, um, to help those who are marginalized move away from the problems that are keeping their lives down. And I think all of that is very noble, but the important part of that is that it has to be voluntary because if, you know, there, there's the really insidious term that gets used all the time is the word we, and people say, we should do this. We should help the homeless. We should increase health funding. We should do this. And what people usually mean when they say we is they mean someone else who I will delegate should take money from you and do this thing that I suggest. And so as long as they can take money from me or value from me, and I'm, I'm including myself in, in, this, in the useful members of society, as long as they can take value from those of us who produce, those of us who run businesses, those of us who do something useful, and spend it in a way that is not aligned with the interests of the people they just took the money from, that is in line with these vague concepts of the greater good driven by this we scenario, then this can never be a just act. This is always going to be a theft. And it doesn't matter how good the intentions of the people stealing the money are. And it doesn't matter how good the outcome of the fact that they steal the money will be. It will always still be theft. And so that's the first problem. The second problem is that because the incentives for everything are misaligned, Right? So the government takes this money from me, they take a cut. They give it to a charity who's going to help the homeless. The charity takes a cut. And there isn't an incentive along the way for these people to spend the money properly. There's no disincentive for them to, to avoid wasting or stealing the money. And that, this is a problem that is ubiquitous across every government in the world. And so the question, I guess, comes down to if there was no government, would there still be a social safety net? Would rich people donate their time and money? to causes that they believe in? And I think the answer is obviously yes. And not only would people still fund voluntarily these kind of programs that they, they want to see existing in the world, those of us who, who are in the productive class will actually have a lot more money to fund those things because the compounding effects of not having our capital stolen from us over time will just drastically increase the prosperity of everyone involved. And so Really, the, the entire economy will be much more useful. A lot more prosperity will be created. And I would rely on the, 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 the good feelings of those who end up wealthy and under a Bitcoin standard to pay for a lot of social services. And not only that, they'll pay for these services in a way that avoids the kind of crushing bureaucracy that we see through the government right now. Like, I don't know what the, I don't know what the total is, but for every dollar that, uh, you know, the, the government prints and, and therefore steals from the rest of us, a massive percentage of that spending is going to their own pockets, to their own bureaucracy, to their own comforts, and then and then to the, the, the sort of crony capitalism of giving government contracts to their friends and all this stuff. It's 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 very rare that you see a government take some money and actually do something useful with it. I wholeheartedly agree with all you, you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to give a comment, but I, I think I just leave it at that, that I completely agree with. Like I usually um, vote for the, the political party that tries to, to make the argument that we need less government. <laughs> and that's actually uh, sometimes different uh, parties. It's interesting to see different kinds of votes, but it's, it's sometimes really hard to find that party because most parties are like, we need more money for that. So like they all want more money, but for different causes. And then they're like, yeah, they, I cannot vote for any one of this. Um, one other topic that I want to make uh, open today before we got, come to the end routine is we kind of had it a little bit with the uh, 6102 uh, order um, with Bitcoin ETFs. It's, it's interesting for me that now there's like this, all those um, traditional finance money coming in and traditional finance products coming in. I mean, in Europe, we have a Bitcoin ETF, ETP since like 2015, I think. As a Bitcoin ETF in Canada, I also had it before US. So the Bitcoin ETF is just news for America, but America is so big that it's news all around the world. 
But the thing is like banks trying to move into Bitcoin, we have it in a lot of different countries. We have now like Bitcoin ETFs, BlackRock coming into Bitcoin, and they all want to uh, basically convince us that we don't need to take self-custody. Bring the Bitcoin to us, we will take care of you, uh, we will take care of your Bitcoin. Is that a potential danger to, to, to the Bitcoin hodlers and, and, and Bitcoiners with like maybe the, as you said before, uh, they have to come to your house and hold the gun, uh, but maybe they can just go to BlackRock and say like, oh, th those are now government property. That's an easier way and they already hold some Bitcoin. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's an obvious risk. Um, I will put it out there also that I would be willing to hold on to everyone's Bitcoin for them. Like that. Like why would you? Why would, yeah, why would you trust somebody who says that? Right, that makes no sense. But that is kind of an inevitable scenario. I think you know we've got a mass amount of Bitcoin, that all the ETFs, BlackRock, etc., all of MicroStrategy's coins are all sitting in Coinbase, and the chances that um, the Coinbase will hand those coins over to the United States government in their entirety are 100%. It's just a matter of timeline. It's there's there's literally zero chance that they will not come for those coins someday. And really, I expect that that probably will be part of the death throes of the United States when they actually come to that point, because ultimately what a an, an inflationary spiral involves generally is you get to a point where the guys with guns will no longer take the dollars that you print in order to rob people. And you need a different way to pay them. And we saw that very quickly the Venezuelan government started paying their military in American dollars. Well, the rest of the country was not allowed to be using American dollars. And so that's what we're going to see in the United States is eventually the need for the state to seize all of the Bitcoins that they can get their hands on to continue to spend. And the, the logical thing to do, the smart thing to do would be at the time that they seize those Bitcoins, which is going to be several million Bitcoin, to repeg their currency to a value backed by those bitcoins right but they're not going to do that they're they're addicted to the they're addicted to the the spending they're addicted to the money printing machine and the fact is that the the vast vast majority of the services that the federal government of the united states offers need to stop being offered because they can't pay for them it's it's just math, right? And eventually that will come true. They can't keep sending an unlimited amount of money to Ukraine and Israel and wherever else the next, you know, there, there'll be another war on the horizon six months from now. There's always, an, there's always another war as long as they have the ability to print money to pay for it. And that addiction to that spending is not going to go away until it's forced to go away. And it won't be forced to go away at that point that we're describing because what I expect them to do is to steal the coins that are in Coinbase, MicroStrategy, all the ETFs, etc. They'll issue some IOUs that will either be denominated in dollars or they may even be denominated in, in Bitcoin. They may, they may say, you know, the, the United States government owes you 3 million Bitcoin. Whatever that IOU is worth, you know, you can all make your own choices. But the, what will follow is that they'll take the millions of Bitcoin that they've stolen and then they'll spend them. And when they spend them, they will run out. And eventually at some point they will be completely out of Bitcoins that they can seize. They will no longer have the ability to print dollars to spend. And at that point they will not have the ability to pay for the massive military apparatus that holds the whole thing up. That's not really interesting. Also, I think the, the example with and the comparison with Venezuela is really suiting because that, th that country is literally we've seen what happens also interesting that there i think like one third of the population left like that's that's like uh, the game theory aspect of of like the, the countries that adopt the bitcoin standard or can kind of get the bitcoiners to come to them will probably win out in, in the long run because we see them actually moving i see a lot of even germans they are now moving to el salvador it's fascinating to, for me to, to see so many one other topic that i almost forgot you you raised it before we started recording, you, you have a, a conference coming up and there's one interesting topic, uh, psychedelics and Bitcoin. Uh, it's interesting because I had with Ioni uh, Appleberg, is it Ioni or something like that? Appleberg, who wrote the book also, uh, Abundance Through Scarcity. And he, with him, I also went <laughs> down, down that rabbit hole. Uh, 
Uh, what is it makes it special that psychedelics and Bitcoin rabbit hole? Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, the event is called Sovereign Minds. Um, SovereignMinds.ca is the website. We've got really inef inexpensive tickets and uh, we're hoping to get a lot of different communities in. And so, yeah, the, the event is focused on Bitcoin, gold, psychedelics, personal healing, circular economies, and Bitcoin again. And so it's, like I mentioned, very Bitcoin focused. We're trying to bring in these adjacent economies, or sorry, adjacent communities, because I see a lot of these people as being the potential next future Bitcoiners. You know, these are in a lot of cases, people who've identified the problem of the over extension and ever expanding creep of the government's reach, power and spending. And the difference is that they haven't necessarily seen the solution that we have seen. And so we're trying to get Bitcoin in front of more of these crowds. Um, and to your question about psychedelics, I found, you know, we, we wanted to include psychedelics in this event because I've actually found a lot of Bitcoiners who have had really great experiences and, and have really been involved in the psychedelic communities. And at first I was kind of like searching for why that was, you know, and I think I found the answer eventually after talking to enough of them is that both psychedelics and Bitcoin tend to sort of have mind opening properties. You know what I mean? You have experiences with both of these things and they start to shake your belief in the institutions of modern society. And they start to make it more likely that you can accept new ideas that challenge those norms. And so I've seen in both cases, I've seen a lot of people come from psychedelics into Bitcoin. And again, partly because there are a lot of Bitcoiners that are into psychedelics, I've seen the opposite happen again and again, where people get into Bitcoin. This is my experience. I never had really much of any experience with psychedelics until I was in the Bitcoin community and, and talking to people that I was like, you know what? Um, like 20 years ago, I might have looked at these things much more differently. You know, they were they were drugs. They were scary. They're not something that I would have wanted in my life. But um, seeing enough what I consider intelligent, reasonable people talking to me about their positive experiences with these things led me to a point of being like, maybe I should look into this stuff. And I think that goes in both directions. You see the Bitcoiners in the psychedelic community um, showing Bitcoin as a solution to all of these problems out there. And this is the same for, this is the same for gold. This is the same for sort of like the freedom community. Um, we want to bring these people in because they, they should be open to the discussion. At least they should be open to see what we see. That's very true. I, 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 lo I love it when we can bring different communities uh, together. That's also what I try slowly, slowly with the podcast, getting people that have a small connection with Bitcoin, but have mostly in another uh, group of people connected. So that's, that's really interesting to, to get those different communities together because we can learn from each other and we should not like bubble each other up and we can do a small, small thing. Uh, we should actually search for those connections. I love it a lot. Um, now let's come closer to the end of the podcast. I have always one question that I ask every guest of mine. Uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? That's a good question. I mean, my... I, I feel like I kind of rant professionally almost at this point. And a lot of what I end up ranting about is the the state of the world and the state of our society and the 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 evils of central planning and, and collectivism. And all of those things have to do with Bitcoin, but they don't. You know what I mean? There they are problems that Bitcoin solves. Um I think if you were to look back at at this interview or any of the other ones that I've done recently, that's that's mostly what I end up ranting about is just the, the way that the world has conspired to create this machine that essentially fucks us. And now we have a way to stop getting fucked. Love it. Really, really cool. Perfect. Then uh, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. What is the most interesting fact about Satoshi Nakamoto? Well, the most interesting fact about Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a good question. Um, well, I think the most interesting thing is that the money hasn't moved, right? Because that's part of what makes Bitcoin so unique is that Satoshi left or died whenever he or she left or died. Because everyone who's founded another coin, you know, if you look down the list of the founders of the top 10 next coins, they're all billionaires because they founded those coins. And it's almost like an immaculate conception wherein the creation of Bitcoin and 
the both the process of reaching a network effect that happened at the same time as the process of the decentralization of control over the, the code base and the implementation of that code base all sort of happened organically. And there's not really a way to duplicate that. And so Satoshi disappearing, I guess, and leaving the money on the table either indicates that it's the CIA or some other organization with the ability to take a very low time preference view of those those coins, or that um, if it was an individual, which I suspect is much more likely that this person has died or otherwise become unable to access the coins, because it it would it it would be very unlikely for someone to leave billions of dollars on the table. Yeah, it's interesting. For me, I have another theory that I'm like, if I would actually create Bitcoin, I I would make it kind of known okay i have like this one million bitcoin but then i would also not make it known that i have some some other small stack <laughs> that involves some i don't know ten thousand bitcoins or something like that like in, in case it catches on i want to create this because he was like we don't know too much about him but i think he was very or she was very intentional about what he's trying to do so this first 1 million Bitcoin that it's not movable that was not something by accident, I think. I mean, we can only speculate. But nobody really knows. But my best case is like, it was not by accident. He, he really did like this 1 million. And then he just has like a, a separate thing where he like, oh, let's, let's get 10,000 Bitcoin in some separate wallet. If it, in case it catches on, I have something or he just died. I mean, that's also a very realistic scenario because it's it's kind of a, a wonder because still after like 15 years and so many people really desperately want to figure out who Satoshi Nakamoto is and, and putting like a lot of money and a lot of resources behind that question. It's it's kind of a wonder that we still don't know uh, this guy. So probably yeah. he's gone. <laughs> my uh, my be The best theory that I've seen out there is the Len Sasserman theory, which if you Google Len Sasserman, um, he kind of, he fit the, the mold for everything and he committed suicide right around the time that Satoshi disappeared. So that would, that would explain everything about Satoshi. Um, but there's no like hard evidence of that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the most fun theory is Steve Jobs because he also died around that. that area. I think that that would be the, the most fun one. If, if Steve Jobs, uh, Great a Bitcoin. He definitely had the means to it and probably also no knowledge. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Perfect. Then, yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Before I let you go, uh, where can people find you, ask you questions, and see more about you? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on most platforms as Bitcoin Brains. I'm on Twitter, Noster, et cetera. We also have our conference that we put on called the Bitcoin Rodeo. And I run a, a YouTube channel called CoinBeast along with the website coinbeast.com. So you can get me on any of those places and uh, look me up. I'm easy to find. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.